Okay. A lot of questions. <laughs> That's good. I'm glad you are taking an interest. That's always nice. So I'm very happy with that. So let's uh, fire away and see what happens. And if you wish to uh, kind of come back to me after I do the questions or you feel that you want to add a secondary question, you're very welcome to do so. We can have a bit of interaction. I don't mind that at all. Sometimes it's nice to have interaction. It makes people more engaged. And I think engagement is a very important part of uh, learning Dhamma. So that, that would be, that's good. Huh? So Sukhi Hotu Ajahn, this is with regards to my meditation. I appreciate your guidance. Uh, I notice my mind is flooded with all kinds of thoughts. Yeah, surprise, surprise. Uh, <laughs> from what meals to prepare, chores uh, undone to ideas that uh, uh, tries to distract me, uh, or thoughts on how to draft my questions to Ajahn. <laughs> okay. Sometimes I can be kind and remind myself these thoughts will leave eventually. And on some days frustration comes and I will end up getting a really bad headache and tiredness comes. As most of the time I, uh, I never got to the third stage of Anapanasati, which you mentioned as watching the breath itself. How to go about this herd, Lajan? What are is the little joys for me to look for out for during such difficult situations to keep on being motivated to continue my daily meditation practice. Um, okay, so wh what you um, have to do is you have to learn to uh, learn to um, just enjoy what you have. Uh, yeah, remember the idea that uh, sometimes meditation is not going to be very profound. If you can get a little bit of peace in your meditation, if you can enjoy what you have just a little bit, uh, yeah, that is already worthwhile. Uh, and very often in daily life can be very stressful. Uh, and uh, you, don't, you want to be able to relax from that stress. Even, even if you can just relax from the stress, already you're doing really well. Uh, so remember the idea of the armchair, right? Uh, not really trying. The reason you get frustrated is because you've forgotten about the armchair. Uh, if you just relax and you just enjoy sitting in the armchair, you never get frustrated because you're not trying anything. You're not trying to get anywhere. Because you're not trying to get anywhere, you're just relaxing. Yeah, so the idea of the armchair is the idea of that you come home from work, you're tired from working really hard, and because you're tired, you just sit down and just relax in your armchair. What do you do when you relax coming home from work? You do nothing. There's nothing to be done. You don't point your mind. You allow your mind to run. In the same way, you allow your mind to run in the same way uh, in, during the meditation. You don't actually do anything with it. Uh, and you just wait for the thinking to kind of abate a little bit, to die down, for your energy to come back, just like you do when you sit in your armchair in your house. Uh, this is kind of the idea here, yeah? And then you start to notice that the mind becomes more peaceful. Uh, you start to notice the happiness and joy of that peace, and then you allow the process to continue. Uh, even if you can do that much, you can you are, can do quite well, yeah. And then you actually will kind of be uh, be on the right track. Yeah? So, what about the general idea of dealing with thoughts? Because the way to deal with the thinking mind is really outside of meditation practice. Uh, because it is when you are outside of meditation that you prepare the mind for dealing with the thinking. Yeah? Why do you think? And I can give you a couple of reasons why you think. The first one is because you think the things, the things you think about are important. That's why you think about those things. Uh. And so when you think about all of the things in daily life, the meal, the things you have to prepare, uh, the writing, the question, <laughs> or whatever, when you think about those things, you think that these things are important in life. Uh. And why are they important? They are important because it, you are going to resolve these issues. Yeah? These are things that you're going to resolve. You are, in a sense, creating the future. You think that you are creating the future when you resolve and think about these issues. Uh, but actually, you're not really creating the future because these questions are endless. Yeah? Preparing a meal is endless. There's always another meal around the corner. So you are just, do, you're just uh, doing things that have no end to them. Uh. These problems never come to an end. There's another problem around the corner, and then you will resolve that one. Huh? So what you have to understand is that by thinking about those things, you're not actually really doing anything useful. 
you're not really creating the future. Huh? Yeah, the future just goes on, more of the same, again and again and again, without really getting anything real done. Huh? And then you die, you're still going to prepare the meals, you get reborn, you continue preparing meals. Yeah? Where is it going to end? Yeah, there's, there's no end to preparing those blooming meals. Huh? And so, what do you do instead? You start to say, well, actually, the way to create the future, the way the future is created is not by preparing the meals, resolving the problems, and all these kind of things. The way the future is created is by the kamma that you make now. The future, the future that is worthwhile, is the happy future that happens through doing good right now. And doing good right now includes being quiet and peaceful with your mind, having good intentions, having a sense of metta and compassion for the world. That is actually where you create the future. So the future that you think about, that future doesn't exist. That future is, is, that isn't there. It is no future. It's more of the same. The real future that you want to create is the future that happens by having good intentions, inclining the mind in the right way. So you need to think like this. And when you think like this, all the thinking in your mind becomes irrelevant. You understand it is a waste of time. And for that reason, it's become, becoming less interesting to you. Because you understand, actually, that is not where, how you create the future. Yeah. So, reflect like this, start to understand what is going on in your mind, yeah? uh, and then your attitude will, will change. I'm not sure how clear I am. I, I guess I'm getting a bit tired myself towards the end of the day, so I hope it is not entirely, utterly nonsense what I'm saying. I hope there's a tiny bit of sense there. But... Um, that's kind of the idea. So this is number one reason. Number two reason why you think yeah, is because meditation isn't all that interesting. Yeah, oh yeah, bo boring, yeah, breath, boy. Yeah. Better think about something else because the breath is too boring. Yeah. And that is where the idea of enjoyment of the meditation comes in. Uh, yeah? Learning to enjoy what you have. Uh, if you enjoy the meditation, uh, then the uh, uh, you don't, the mind is not so interested in thinking anymore because the thinking is only interesting if meditation is boring. Yeah? So learn to enjoy. This is why I say be in the armchair. Yeah? Just learn to just enjoy being peaceful, allowing the mind to be, not striving, yeah? but just enjoying the peace. Yeah? And as you see the beauty of just sitting back and leaning back and just allowing your mind to be peaceful, as you see the beauty of that, uh, the mind starts to incline towards that. Uh, you enjoy the meditation. And then, as you start to feel a little bit peaceful, that's when you bring in these ideas that actually bring happiness to the mind. Yay, I'm a Buddhist, for goodness sake, I feel so lucky. All of these other people in the world, they have no idea that they're missing out. They are really missing out. I'm one of the few people in the world. Buddhism is a small religion, let's face it, right? We are a small don't tell anyone, we are the elite, yeah? <laughs> Pe keep it quiet. <laughs> so this is, no, I'm just joking, we should never think like that. But actually, we're very, very fortunate to come across the Dhamma. It is very rare in the world to come across these teachings. Uh, so feel so fortunate. Uh, feel that you are, have all of these beautiful friends around you, all the Kalanimittas, people practicing in the same way. You have the Buddha, the greatest spiritual master in the history of the world. He is your teacher. Wow! Wow! <laughs> right? I mean, <coughs> it is actually real wow, right? It actually is something extraordinary. It's just that we don't really understand it. That's why we're not kind of, you know, <laughs> really going out of our minds with, with wowedness because it is so extraordinary what is going on there. <coughs> and so you feel that joy. You know that you have been living well for a long time. You take a sense of gratitude for all of this, the joy of living well, all of these kind of things, and you build these things up, uh, and then it starts to happen. Uh. So this is like how you make it work, and if it still doesn't work, uh, then the reason is you just need to develop more on the path. Yeah, You need to practice more, uh, and as you practice more, and as you uh, do more good things, you live well, gradually you will get there one day, it starts to work. In the meantime, don't meditate too much. Don't have a set, t t do short meditations. Do things you can do. Do 15 minutes only. If you can't do 15, do 10 minutes, right? Do short meditations so that you actually enjoy what you're doing. Yeah. This is really important. Uh, 
If you cannot meditate every day, every other day, at least on the weekends, yeah, something like that. Uh, do what can be done. Set the bar really low. Don't put the bar too high. Set the bar low. Uh, Sometimes, if you can, hang out with your spiritual friends, do meditation with them. Don't get a headache. If you feel frustrated, stop the meditation. Yeah, Headache is not something that you want to get. That's really, really a bad idea. Okay, so try some of that. I, I'll, uh, I'll stop there, because otherwise we're going to spend the whole uh, evening just on that one question. So let's, uh, let's go on to the next one. Dear Ajahn, may I seek further understanding about seeking refuge in the Buddha Dhamma as Sangha? Besides the common ritual part of chanting the three refuges and paying respects, what are the deeper aspects of seeking refuge? How can I arouse that deep inspiration, confidence and support from a practice to go further on? Thank you for your guidance. So, um, uh, the, the I the idea of refuge is to have confidence and faith in the teaching of the Buddha. Yeah, that's what it really is about. So the more confidence you have in these teachings, the deeper is your refuge in those teachings. So what you have to do is just to try to understand these teachings properly. The more you understand them, the more you understand what it is that you have to do, the more confidence you have, the more ability you will have to practice this path all the time, moment to moment, day in, day out. Yeah? So come back to these teachings. Uh, read the suttas if you enjoy that. Listen to talks that inspire you. Go to the teachers that you actually find inspiring. Be careful not to have too many teachers. Uh, one of the dangers in the world that I see, people have a lot of teachers, and sometimes it can get very confusing. Uh, once you are happy with certain teachers, uh, two, three, four teachers, uh, not too many, stay with those teachers because you know and you feel that they are trustworthy and you can actually stay with them. Uh, too much is going to be, be problematic. Yeah. Then keep on practicing this path in the right way. When you need inspiration, go back to a nice talk, listen to a sutta reading, an explanation, to bring the inspiration back again. When the inspiration comes back, your commitment and your perseverance on the path will also come back again as a consequence. So keep on coming back to the suttas. Keep on coming back to the word of the Buddha. Allow the Buddha to inspire you. If it is through the voice of a teacher, that is okay. So this is how you gradually build these things up. And as you do this, as you understand what is going on, as you understand the power of these teachings, that is how the refuge then gets developed through your understanding, through your faith and confidence in what is happening here. Come on a visit to Jana Grove. Yeah, come and stay in the monastery for a while. We can come and stay at Bodhinana Monastery as well. Yeah, hang out with the monks for a while and see what happens. If you are a lady, come go to Damasara Monastery, hang out with the nuns for a while. Yeah, it's a beautiful thing to do to stay at Damasara Monastery. It's um, very rare in the world to find a really well-developed monastery for nuns. Damasara Monastery is incredibly well developed. They have a property of 600 acres. Yeah, it's a very large property. In Malaysia, you own half the country if you have 600 acres. No, I'm, I'm exaggerating. But it's a, it's a large property in Malaysia because land is much more expensive here than in Australia. So it's very rare for women to have that opportunity. So come down there yeah, and uh, check it out. Stay in the monastery for a while. Hang out with the nuns. The nuns there are great. I know those nuns. They're really good nuns. Uh, Hasapanya, Venerable Hasapanya, who is the abbot there, she's a Malaysian nun, right? She's right from, from here. And she is a very happy person, lots of energy, and uh, very uh, hasapanya. 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 Is it venerable hasapanya? Ajahn hasapanya. So check it out. Okay, next question. Sukehuntu Ajahn. I appreciate if you can elaborate how ill will causes drowsiness and dullness of the mind. Also, how do we go about this? Uh, so ill will, you know what it's like if you get very angry with someone, uh, you can just feel it yourself. Uh, then afterwards, it's like you are depleting your energy because when you have ill will, you're using a lot of energy. Huh? 
Sometimes people say, oh, you have to get angry, because when you get angry, you get all of this energy. True, anger leads to energy, but then you use it all up, and afterwards you feel completely loss of energy. Energy is all gone. Yeah, This is kind of the downside of using ill will to gain energy. So you get drowsy and tired afterwards. So what do you have to do? What you have to do is not get the ill will in the first place. Uh, that is really the issue here. So avoid ill will. Uh, how do you avoid ill will? Well, ill will usually happens in relation to other people, so you have to learn to look at other people in the right way. Uh, look at other people with compassion. Uh, look at other people with understanding. They are suffering in the world. Even the great, so-called great leaders of our society, really they are suffering. They don't really know what they're doing. They are really just human beings, just like us. Uh, yeah? And so they have no idea what's going on. Have compassion for them. Uh, then you are on the right track. Uh, never judge someone. Uh, never think that you understand anyone. Uh, if someone treat it, treats you badly, it is not your problem. It is their problem. Uh, because they are the one who make bad karma at that particular point. You happen to be in the wrong place at the wrong time, so they treat you badly. Actually, it's got nothing to do with you. It has to do with them. Don't take it personally, because it's not personal. It has to do with their inner problems. This is how you have to think. All right. Dear Ajahn, thank you so much for your teaching. I am inspired. Okay, good. <laughs> but I notice my mind likes to find excuses to get out of tight corners. For example, I saw my mind saying, you can't, you can't do the remote lodgings in the wilderness because your conduct is not pure. <laughs> and that thought makes me feel better. <laughs> okay. How to deal with a mind that likes to find excuses? Thank you, Ajahn. So, um, um, you, <laughs> so you, what you have to do is you have to remember that uh, I guess you have one, you have this life. Now you have the Buddhist teachings. Yeah, now is your chance to do things that you normally don't have an opportunity to do. Remind yourself what is really important in life. All the ordinary things that you do in life. Yeah they are not really going to get you all that far on the path. Uh, yeah? So don't just stick to the ordinary things. When you die, when you're on your deathbed, and or you look back on your life, and all the things that you have done are just ordinary things, eating, drinking, cleaning the house, going to work like a robot, doing nothing really interesting, and now on my deathbed, no, I wasted my life. Yeah, I had the opportunity, and I did everything that everyone else does. I didn't take the opportunity to do something more interesting with my life. See it from the point of view, the vantage point of your deathbed. And when you see it from that vantage point of your deathbed, you realize you want to use life wisely, so that when you die, you can feel satisfied that you made the most out of this life. You have this one opportunity. Don't allow you to be distracted by all the worldly things. I don't mean to say that the ordinary life cannot be useful. It can be very useful. Uh, if you use your ordinary life wisely, uh, if you use your ordinary life to be kind, uh, to be caring, to look after your family members properly, your colleagues properly, you do the very best in ordinary life, then actually ordinary life turns into a spiritual path because you live in a wise way. Uh, so that is also a very important part of the spiritual path. Live wisely in your daily life. Uh, but also add something more to it, uh, add something really inspiring, something different uh, that can take you one step further on this path. Uh, yeah, And uh, gradually you can overcome those excuses because you realize that actually they're just holding you back uh, and not giving you the maximum opportunity to uh, uh, develop yourself. Uh. So, uh, it's true that may, maybe you can't do remote lodgings, yeah? So don't do remote lodgings. Do semi-remote lodgings, uh, yeah? Halfway houses. Do the halfway houses instead. Uh, and uh, coming to, you know, going to a retreat center is something everyone can do. It's like a halfway house to the re remote lodgings. Uh. All right. Uh, let's go on to the next one. Hi, Bante. If it's okay with you to share, which drawbacks during your contemplations made you give up the lay life? <laughs> well, 
what are the drawbacks that kind of made me give up the lay life. Uh, uh, it's kind of strange. I think, I, first of all, I had plenty of suffering in my life and I was fed up with that suffering and I guess I wanted to find a way out. That was a very important part of it. Uh, everyone has suffering in their life, yeah? And I was certainly no exception to that. Uh, that was a big part of it. Uh, but uh, it, it's kind of interesting when I look back on my own life and I try to understand why it is that I became a monk. Yeah? To tell you the truth, I think it's a habit from the past. <laughs> What do I mean? I think I was a monk in a past life, yeah? Or I would talked about this before, a nun in a past life. And because I think I was a monk or nun in a past life, I just have the habit of being a monk, yeah? yeah? So I'm a monk in this life as well. Huh? So is that good or bad? Well, it's a good habit, right? So because it's a good habit, I'm quite happy with, with that habit. But it's also kind of scary, because if you become a monk just out of habit, you wonder, am I a monk because I'm trapped by the habit? Or am I a monk? Because actually it's a good idea. And that's kind of a scary thought. So that actually made me read the suttas more. Am I really doing this for the right reason? And then I read the suttas, yes, I'm doing it for the right reason. Okay, I'm going to carry on as a monk. Otherwise, I might as well disrobe if it's a bad idea. So I would say it's a mixture of many things that made me a monk. First of all, I think a strong inclination from the past. Yeah, that, that has been there all along. I had some experiences when I was young that kind of make me think that uh, I've been a monk in the past life or a nun in the past life. And uh, also the idea of reading, understanding, later on reading and understanding the suttas and uh, coming to uh, an understanding of the word of the Buddha, but also because of suffering in life. Yeah, I, I also had plenty of suffering. I don't know if uh, you know that may not be obvious to you now. I mean, I've been a monk for a long time, but like everyone else, I had my share of... Uh, problems and issues. Uh, that's just what life throws at you. Uh, never think that you are alone if you suffer. Uh, you're just one of everyone else. Everyone has plenty to deal with in this life. Uh, is anyone here who hasn't had much suffering in their life? Who just sailing through, plain sailing? Uh, you? Okay. The venerable here is, 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 is the one of the few ones. Plain sailing. Okay. <laughs> Most people have enough things to deal with. Uh, there is a, um, another book online called uh, Why I Am a Buddhist Monk. Yeah. And if you wish, you can read that book. It's also written by a certain Ajahn Brahmali. So you can, uh, <laughs> you can, you can check, check it out and see what you think. Yeah. <laughs> some, yeah. some people said it was a nice book to read. So you may wanna, maybe you want to read that one. Why I Am a Buddhist Monk. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, next question. Dear Ajahn, can you please explain why you say sexuality is not a bad sensual pleasures uh, and you also added kindness into the equation isn't it true that the buddha said a woman's smile sight scent touch are dangerous <laughs> please enlighten me on this point ajahn thank you um the the point here is that uh, you know when you read the suttas you see that people even people who were on the stages of awakening uh, they had ordinary marital relationships. Yeah? Even people who were stream mentors, uh, once returners, had these things. Uh, and uh, so these are not evil things. Yeah? You're not hurting anyone. What is bad in the world is hurting other people. Uh, that is what is bad. Uh, and sexuality is not hurting anyone, so it is not really bad, right? Uh, so this is kind of the point. So what we should focus on in the world are those things that are truly hurtful to others. Uh, that's what I mean by kindness is by far the most important thing here. If you can live a life of kindness, uh, if you can have metta and compassion in your heart, you can treat everyone in your life well, then you are on the right track. That is the most important thing here. It is true that in the very higher realms of the path, then even sexuality is considered not useful, yeah? Why? Because it takes you away from the, uh, the happiness within. All the sensual pleasures are external things. It takes the mind out into the world. And because sexuality is a very powerful force in human beings, it takes the mind outside. And so it makes samadhi very difficult in the long run. So when you come to the point of your life where samadhi starts to work and meditation starts to work, then you want to reduce some of these external sensual pleasures like that. Uh, because then it becomes impossible to, uh, to, you can't really work them together anymore. 
But for most people, it's quite a long way down the track. Yeah. Know how to do the right thing at the right time. That is what is important. Yeah. If you try to go too fast, you are going to limit some of the joys of life that are available to people. Yeah? The reason we get reborn as a human being is because we enjoy these kind of pleasures. Yeah. And it is okay. Then when your mind starts to become very peaceful, you start to have good mindfulness, the meditation starts to work, then you can reduce some of the worldly pleasures because they get in the way of the meditation. You have something better anyway. Because you have something better, you don't need those ordinary pleasures of the world anymore. Huh? So get do things in the right sequence. If you don't do things in the right sequence, you're throwing away some of the pleasures of life, uh, getting nothing in return. That is not worth it. Uh. This is what I mean by this. Uh. The most important thing at the early points in the path is to be kind. Uh. Have metta, have compassion, don't get angry. Uh. This is kind of the real big issues. Uh. Be as kind as you possibly can at all times. Be generous, be a good person. Then you're on the right track. Yeah. I hope that makes sense. So, um, go on to the next one. I'm going a little bit fast because of all the, uh, the questions that are here. Dear Ajahn, I wish to seek your advice how to cope with fear. The mind is so conditioned with fear of a funeral since a child, including funeral of my parents, uh, somewhat I lo loved so much. Uh, so much anxiety, fear experienced when going through his funeral. Dare not go near his body. Uh, so my parent, okay. So sad and disheartening. <laughs> Thank you, Ajahn. Um, so don't be sad about it. Yeah, this is the human condition. We have our fears. It is never sad. It's just your condition. Don't feel. If you feel sad about it, you are adding something to the experience, which makes it even worse. So um, remember that uh, anxiety and fear is always some kind of fault finding with the future. You think the future is somehow going to be scary. Maybe you had some experience in a past life, probably that's what you did, that conditioned you in this way. Yeah, Something about death that has kind of scared you. So what you have to do is you just have to keep on practicing the path and gradually this conditioning that we have, it, probably not from childhood, probably is even before childhood that you had these things, gradually this conditioning will actually disappear. And the way that it disappears is because you live well. And when you live well, you start to know that your future is going to be a good one. This is kind of one of the magics about living well, and which I have noticed in my own life. When you live with a lot of kindness in the world, when you have compassion and metta for every, pretty much everyone around you, you always feel good about yourself. When you always feel good about yourself, you actually know that your future is going to be a good one. You can feel it inside. And the moment you know that your future is going to be a good one, anxiety and fear have no place anymore. So live the path to the maximum of your ability. Be kind and caring to others, to everyone. And as you do that, you will start to find that all of these negative qualities of the mind, they start to disappear. And also use this mantra, if you like, that uh, uh, good people have a good future. Yeah. So you are already living well, that's why you're here. If you weren't here, if you, the very fact that you're here means that you are a good person. So you can already know that you have a fairly good future, because you're already doing the right thing. Yeah? Good people have a bright future. You have a bright future. Continue to build on that goodness. And as you do that, the brightness will become more and more apparent to you. One day, the fear of death will be completely gone. Huh? And you will be able to go to funerals again. And you won't actually be frightened of these things. Uh, anxiety and fear will no longer be there. Huh? So that's what you can do. You can also, if you wish, you can go to a therapist sometimes. Sometimes it can be nice to get some professional help because sometimes people, uh, professionals, they have their own little tools that can be used for these kind of things. Uh, Buddhism doesn't always have all the answers. There are other answers as well uh, in this world. Uh, and uh, maybe you can speak to some of the people here at the BGF. They might be able to give you some guidance in that area. So there's a brief answer for you on, on that one here. Uh. Dear Ajahn, following your reply to the sister just now, before lunch, I think this may be yesterday, I'm not sure, 
Does it mean that it is impossible for a lay person to attain the jhana state? You have to renounce to be able to attain them. It is not impossible. There are lay people to s who sometimes attain these kind of things. Yeah, you go on a retreat, you renounce a lot of the world, you leave all of these things behind. Sometimes lay people have these experiences. But uh, don't worry about it, don't think about it, don't crave these experiences. Take one small step at a time. Are you enjoying what you have now? And if you are enjoying the peace that you have now in your meditation, then keep on enjoying that. And as you enjoy what you have, it goes to a deeper stage by itself. And then you enjoy the next stage. And by enjoying that next stage that you are experiencing, it goes even beyond. It goes another stage beyond that. Jhanas are often a long, long way away. And before you even get to those jhana states, there's enormous amounts of happiness on this path, enormous amounts of peace, tranquility, and joy to be experienced. Enjoy every one of those stages as you move along, and as you enjoy what you have, the next stage arises within the previous stage. And then you also do all the other factors of the path, all working together in this way, and your meditation starts to evolve, and you have no idea where it's going to end. Will you ever attain jhana? It's hard to say, but at least you are on the right track. And all you should really look for is being on the right track. Because that is really all you can do. You can't force yourself to make the jhana states happen. Sukihotu Ajahn. Reborn is a very vague concept. Even if one were to read the book after, one may not be convinced. I'm Absolutely, you're quite right. Uh, even listening to one who went through a near-death experience may not be convincing. True? It is not because one is biased towards the concept, it's because it can't be seen at the present. Uh, um, I, I can guarantee you that people are biased. Uh, yeah? Everyone is biased. Uh, it is impossible not to be biased. Uh, the reason why we have the views that we have is because of conditioning from the past. If you were conditioned differently, very likely you would believe in rebirth, or you would be even more anti-rebirth. It depends on the conditioning. It feels to you as if you are, your view is rational. That's what it feels to every one of us. But actually it is not so much rational as conditioned into you. I have seen people being completely anti-rebirth to suddenly becoming very pro-rebirth. And in both cases they thought they were fully rational. But actually it is just the conditioning that changes. If you keep on contemplating this subject, you keep on reading books like after, keep on thinking about it, you will be conditioned, dif <laughs> you will be conditioned differently. And as you are conditioned differently, something will change, yeah? Maybe you become even more anti-rebirth, or you become more pro-rebirth, but I guarantee you that your conditioning will change. It is not just a matter of rationality, as you seem to imply here. Yeah? It is actually about conditioning. Yeah? So keep on investigating. Yeah? This is the challenge I'm facing with my elderly parents. Yeah? Even though my mum has attended numerous talks by various adjuncts, and even been on pilgrimage trips, trips, uh, she still harbors deep hatred, resentment to all that have wronged her. Uh, as a daughter, I hope she is not flooded with remorse, anger on her deathbed. Uh, please help, Ajahn. <laughs> um, yes, I, what can you say? Rem remember that People are very complex, yeah? And even though your mother may have uh, harbored negative thoughts and resentment towards people who have wronged her, uh, um, she obviously has many good qualities as well. Otherwise, she wouldn't go on pilgrimage and, and do all of these kind of things. Uh, so it's very hard to know how these things will balance out when she dies, uh, yeah? It is very difficult to know that. Uh, so, um, if you can help her, and you can help her to see things differently, that the people who wronged her, they don't really know what they're doing or whatever, do that. If you can't help her, probably you probably can't help her, that's my, my guess here, then just remind her of the good things that she has done, yeah? To rejoice in the good qualities in her life. 
And then when she rejoices in the good things, then that may actually be what supports her into a good life in the future. Yeah. So uh, don't, these things are not uh, clear cut what's going to happen just because you have certain negative qualities uh, you may have other good qualities that make up for those negative things uh, <coughs> and if you remind her of her good qualities uh, hopefully you will also help her to emphasize those things in her remaining years how many years uh, however many years she has left yeah and be sweet to your mother uh, be kind to her yeah uh, say things that she may never have expected to hear from you uh, as the daughter, tell you how much you love her, tell her how much you appreciate her good qualities, remind her of the kind things that she has done to you during her life, say things that your mother usually doesn't get to hear from her daughter. Yeah. Most daughters don't sh show enough affection. Most sons don't show enough affection. Yeah. If we show more affection to our parents, uh, we're doing a great favor to our parents. Our parents, remember, to pet children are very important to parents. Uh, parents are not as important to children. Uh, so by showing affection, you're doing an Im enormous favor to your parents by doing that. Uh, it is very, very powerful to your parents. Uh, so uh, in this way, you can maybe help her. And by showing that affection and kindness, it may also open her up to the possibility of listening to you, that maybe she can be better at forgiving the people who have wronged her in her life. Uh, we have to come close to people's hearts. This is kind of the critical thing. If you can come close to a person's heart because you are kind and caring, that is when they will listen to you. This is what happened to me and my parents, right? I was able, by living well, doing the right thing, to get closer to them. That's when the Dhamma opened up for my parents. It's very powerful when you can get this thing done in the right way. Anyway, good luck. See what you can do. Do your very best. If you have done your best, at least you will not have any remorse when they pass away. All right. <clears throat> Question. Is there such a teaching as a person requiring wisdom roots to be able to meditate and deepen the practice? Are we born with these roots? any hope for those born without the good roots. This idea of wisdom roots, this is kind of the Abhidhamma ideas, uh, yeah, that people have certain roots, and if you haven't got any roots, you are hopelessly lost in the world. Uh, forget about that whole teaching. Uh, the Buddha says nothing like that in the suttas. Uh, if you are already coming to these kind of talks, it means that you have some wisdom in you, otherwise you wouldn't be here. No one who is completely stupid and ignorant would bother coming to a place like this. Yeah. So well done, you are here. Please now make the most of it. Uh, and so just keep on uh, reflecting on this teaching, keep on practicing in the right way, keep on uh, uh, enjoying the good company of people around you. And as you do that, these things will develop in their own, in their own way. Uh, don't think in terms of whether you are capable or not. Uh, the moment you think that you are incapable, you become incapable, not because you are incapable, but because you think you are incapable. That itself becomes a problem on the path, the fact that you think so. So don't allow the Abhidhamma to lead you astray. That's what I say. All right. Good evening, Ajahn. Referring to an earlier question on Kuan Yin, if a person had, had a Vesak, no, sorry, a weak mental faculty, <laughs> and need someone or some supreme being or God to lean on, uh, putting the worries burden on this Kuan Yin. It is easier. True? I can, I can understand that. Uh, in order to walk the path of the Buddha, it is perceived as difficult as it requires one to be dependent on oneself. Uh, and the path is perceived to be difficult as it requires a strong mind. Uh, question, how should a person of weak mindedness or weak mental faculty mental dis-ease, start practicing and walk the path with a positive result. Um, lean on the Buddha instead of Kuan Yin. Yeah? The Buddha is there and uh, lean on some of the good people around you in the world. Lean on them instead of leaning on Kuan Yin. 
uh, and then uh, then you have something to lean on. I think every, you are right. Many people lean, need something. Lean on something that you feel is safe. Don't lean on dodgy characters. Uh, yeah, then you have a problem. Uh, lean a bit on people like Ajahn Brahm. Yeah, Ajahn Brahm is pretty safe. I can, Ajahn Brahm is not going to disrobe. Yeah, I think that's kind of one of the obvious things in the world. Uh, <laughs> you probably have a hard time find a wife anyway if it is rough. <laughs> 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 no, I, to be honest with you, I think Ajahn Brahm is completely beyond any interest in that kind of thing anyway, so it's kind of completely irrelevant. Uh, Ajahn Brahm is very, very, very good meditation practice. So, uh, but lean on those things in the world that you feel are safe, right? The things that really are, you can support you, uh, and then you can lean on something. Kuan Yin, I wouldn't recommend it. I'd much better to lean on the Buddha and Ajahn Brahm than Kuan Yin. Uh, and uh, then you use that uh, as a support, and then you practice the path like everyone else, yeah, having some kind of support. So, uh, and in a sense, that's what we all do, yeah. I mean, I have lived with Ajahn Brahm for 30 years because I find that supportive to have a teacher like Ajahn Brahm. I lean on the Buddha, that's why I like to read the suttas. So, we all do that to some extent anyway. Some people lean more, some people lean less, but we all have a similar kind of way of doing these things. Okay, dear Ajahn, many thanks and much gratitude for your time and teachings. Uh, you mentioned that of the five hindrances, ill will and irritation should be the one of the top priorities for us to deal with. Please can you share more practical tips on how to deal with such thoughts and signpost us uh, to some suttas on the subject. Uh, the best sutta on the subject is found in the Anguttara Nikaya, Numerical Discourses. Uh, the fifth book, the five, is number 162, is called the Agatha Pativinya Sutta, the sutta on how to remove uh, uh, resentment, ill will, etc. That is kind of the classical sutta on that particular topic. And what the Buddha says uh, in that sutta, or it's actually Venerable Sariputta who gives that sutta, uh, and Gutra 5 is 162, uh, the removing of resentment sutta. And what it says in that sutta is that the first thing that we should do is that we should focus, if a person has many qualities, we should focus on the good qualities in that person. Yeah? This is what we should do. Huh? So for example, here in the BGF, because there are many good people, well-intentioned people, huh? you learn to see the good qualities. Uh, and you focus on that, you enjoy seeing the good qualities, uh, and then you can forgive uh, the small bad qualities uh, that are always going to be there. Yeah? People are not going to be entirely pure because that's kind of very difficult, uh, but there will be good qualities that you can focus on. Uh. If you cannot see any good qualities in a person, then the when Bosariputta says, you should remember that someone who has no good qualities, they are like a sick person. Uh. Yeah? So remember, when you see someone with lots of bad qualities, uh, they should look at them as a sick person. And when you look at a sick person, uh, you have compassion. Uh. How do you feel if someone in your family gets really sick? Yeah? yeah, you want to help them, right? Because they are sick. It's not their fault. Sickness happens to everyone. Uh. In the same way, when someone is really mentally ill, because they have so many bad qualities within, uh, they are sick. They are going towards a very bad rebirth in the future. Uh. Lots of suffering for them. Uh. You should want to help them out of that situation. Uh. Instead of when someone treats you badly because of their bad qualities, uh, instead of getting angry with that person, uh, instead of doing that, uh, you have compassion for them because you know they have a problem. Uh, just because they treat you badly, you don't have to worry about that. Uh, yeah, because actually it's not your problem anyway, it's their problem. Uh, and you have compassion for them instead of getting angry with them. Uh. That is the brief answer to that question. Never take it personally when someone treats you badly. It's not your problem, it is their problem. Huh? Have compassion for people who are bad because they are in deep trouble. Huh? All right, I'm quickly going to go through the last few questions. I'm going to go a little bit over time, so please, please bear with me. Dear Ajahn, over the years I've volunteered at various Buddhist organizations. Uh, sometimes the behavior of some of the devotees can be very challenging. Huh? My understanding is that dana usually gives 
rise to joy. However, in these circumstances, negative thoughts and emotions arise. Eventually, I find it counterproductive and withdraw my services. This cycle has repeated itself on a few occasions. Please, can you advise how one might be able to break this cycle? Yes, it can happen because people sometimes, you know, what often happens is that there are often egos involved in organizations, yeah? People have, this is my idea, my idea is important. Uh, and the best way to uh, be of service in, is an organization is actually very often to put away, put aside your own ideas. Uh, if you have an idea, give it. If no one wants to listen, let go of your own ideas. Uh, and sometimes the best way of being of service is just to be one of the worker ants. Yeah? You're like an ant. You do your job, people say, clean the toilet, you clean the toilet. And you're happy with that, yeah? And that's kind of a beautiful way of giving service in the world. Just being the worker, just being the one who does the work without really worrying about power or position and these kind of things. Let the other people argue, yeah? They can do the arguing. I'm going to do the work in this organization. So find your little corner of the organization, yeah? Work with Bobby. Bobby is really nice. Bobby is super friendly, yeah? And then the deal with Bobby and he will kind of give you a nice job and then you can work, work, work with him in a, in, a, in a beautiful way. Find your corner in an organization where you can do your little thing and you can help out. And you can get away from the politics of the organization. The politics is always the, the difficult part. The egos is a difficult part. One of the ways of doing it as well is uh, it sometimes helps to have a monastic uh, as part of the organization, yeah? someone who can be there, due, especially during the meetings. Uh, when there's a monastic present at the meetings, everyone becomes more kind of subdued. Yeah? This, can be, this can be a very wise thing. So invite some respected monastic to be present during your committee meetings yeah? and see what happens uh, as a result. Uh, I don't know, Ver Venerable uh, Sanang, what, what was his name? Samang Kumara? Sumangala? S S Saranankara, yeah, someone like that. Or maybe Venerable Sumangala, the, the, the bhikkhuni, someone who is respected by the organization, yeah? And ask them at least occasionally to come in and give some advice on how you can do things in more harmony, perhaps. I don't know, something like that. Yeah. But uh, just do your things quietly, yeah, at the back. Don't, don't uh, uh, get too much involved in all these kind of things, uh, because it is just the nature of uh, organizational work, that there often is different opinions, different understandings, uh, yeah? And you just be the kind of the worker at the back who does your duties, uh, doesn't worry too much about these things. Uh. But yes, it is uh, an unfortunate reality of organizational work. Yeah. Okay. So, uh, last questions. Uh. Good evening, Ajahn. Thank you for your guidance us through this morning on the meditation on dying. Uh, uh, on the hospital bed, uh, white walls, etc., what happens if the person who is a serious meditator dies suddenly without having a chance to meditate on dying? Uh, yes, that happens very often to people. Yeah, you die suddenly. Uh, but if you have done the dying meditation, it is almost as if you will be, that will take over the moment you die suddenly. Uh, because no death is really sudden. Uh, yeah, all death is a process. So even though you die in a car accident and it is instantaneous, uh, from your personal perspective, it actually still is a process. Uh, because the moment the body is kind of crushed in that car, in the car accident, uh, it will still take a while for the mind to release from that body. Uh, and that that process happens, uh, that meditation will start to kick in uh, and you will be able to go through the process in the right way. Uh. Yeah? It's very strange when an accident happens, suddenly everything starts to go in slow motion. Uh, the body, the mind starts to release from the body. Maybe you have an outer body experience. Maybe you just watch the whole accident happening from above or something like that. Uh, yeah? And then the process takes over and then you can deal with it in the right way. Uh. So no death is really sudden. Uh. All death is gradual. All death is a process. Uh. Ajahn, you mentioned Ajahn Brahm's positive trauma. Can you please elaborate on this? Uh, it's a beautiful word, isn't it? Uh, so the idea of positive trauma is the idea that the, it is so powerful. Uh, it is so extraordinarily happy. The experience you have is so blissful uh, that it remains with you for the whole rest of your life. You can never forget it. Uh, 
It leaves an imprint on the mind of uh, uh, happiness that is so great. And this is one of the, can be a problem sometimes, uh, because sometimes people go around craving to re experience those things for the rest of their life, never e really being able to let go. That can be the downside of such a thing. And then you have to learn to let it go, even though it has been such a positive trauma in your life. Uh, yeah, the idea of bliss beyond anything you can imagine is possible. Uh, when that hits you, uh, of course, it's going to leave a very, very powerful imprint on your mind. Uh, and this is the idea of positive trauma. Uh, so uh, then you just have to learn to deal with it, uh, learn to let it go, uh, learn to be at ease with it, uh, and then eventually you will re-experience these things. And eventually it becomes kind of... I, I, it doesn't become ordinary, uh, it never becomes ordinary, uh, but it becomes easy to reattain. Uh, it becomes something that you know what to do. Uh, yeah, because you understand the process that leads to these things. So. Ajahn, what would be a concise way to define right view from a lay person to another lay person without going to the uh, aksnes, the, ak the suttas? Uh, so a very simple way of defining right view is to understand the difference between sukkha and dukkha. Right view is understanding where dukkha is and understanding where sukkha is. Understanding that morality is sukkha, immorality is dukkha. Understanding that real meditation is sukkha, lack of meditation, which is sensual, pure sensual indulgence, is dukkha compared to real meditation. Understanding that deep insight is sukkha, being deluded is dukkha. The distinction between happiness and suffering, that is what really right view is about. Good evening, Ajahn. Uh, I assume, this is the last question for tonight, uh, <coughs> I assume when one practices correctly and diligently in meditation, usually there is improvement with the time. Uh, like riding a bicycle, it is uh, time, time learning takes some time, uh, but once learned can be left aside indefinitely. Uh, when the bicycle is picked up after a long time, the cycling skill comes back easily. Uh, does one's meditation disprove, deprove, or improve uh, if left, okay, okay, improve or, or become worse if left unattended for a long time? Uh, well, the answer to that is to remember what the cause of meditation is. Uh, the cause of meditation is the depth of your sila, the depth of your kindness. Uh, so as long as you keep your sila upright, uh, as long as you live with kindness, as long as you have compassion and metta, you will not, it will net, uh, not decline. Your meditation will stay at the same level. If you start to live badly, then of course the meditation will decline as a consequence. So it's not really quite like a bicycle, because learning to ride a bicycle is a skill, and that skill may never actually live. Meditation is not really a skill. Meditation depends on the other development of the mind. That is where meditation comes from. Meditation is so easy once you learn it, uh, or once the, uh, the mind is developed properly, because it, it is an automatic process. Uh, and all you have to do is to sit back and allow it to happen. All it depends on is the quality of the mind that you bring to the meditation. That quality, if you keep it up, uh, meditation will never desert you. Uh, is there such a thing as one's meditation practice in this lifetime being the continuation of what one achieved in the previous life? Absolutely, because the mind continues, right? Just like the mind continues in this life from the meditation you had last year, the meditation to, to have next year, in the same way, the meditation from last life carries on in this life. Previous life stream enter, this life become a sotapanna. Um, Yes, so uh, that too, yeah, even those deep insights on the path, uh, they too will continue on uh, as you practice in the right way, and you will carry on as a consequence. Okay, everyone, uh, I am exhausted now. I'm going to stop. Uh. <laughs> so, okay, so I wish you all a very good night. Please have a night's rest, uh, and we'll see you back again, uh, hopefully tomorrow morning. Uh, and let's pay respect to the Buddha Dhamma Sangha before we leave him.